Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Sen Gupta and we are here in this course Indian Art and today we will be looking into the module 2 or the week 2 and where we are looking at the architecture 1. So there will be two modules or two weeks on architecture and this is the first week on our study in Indian architecture. So in this first week we will be looking into the basics of Buddhist and Jain architecture and in the in the second half uh, in the second part of this uh, module on architecture we will be looking at the Hindu architecture. So the basics of the B Buddhist and Jain architecture that actually entails a, a, a brief understanding of how Buddhism and Jainism that had developed in the Indian subcontinent and their long lasting effect on Indian architecture that we see today. So we will be uh, in as part of this uh, um, weekly lectures, uh, we will be covering mostly the, uh, the Buddhist architecture and towards the end we will be getting into the uh, basics of Jain architecture. So starting with the Buddhist architecture, we know that I mean uh, Buddha, uh, the Gautama Buddha or Prince Siddhartha who was uh, uh, responsible for starting this new religion that we see in the Indian subcontinent. It was, it happened in the around 600 BC. Now before that there is also we can imagine that there is a gap between 1900 BC that we have looked into the Indus Valley sites and something that is happening in the 600 BC. So in between this time which is also considered to be the Vedic period in which we see there are not too many of the material evidences and there are also pottery shreds which are found from some of those sites for example in various sites in Haryana, in parts of Uttar Pradesh, in Rajasthan and so on. In those places we have found some of the pottery shreds and some of the uh, terracotta made uh, material from the post uh, Indus Valley times which are been believed to be part of this Vedic times. So during this time what we find that there are worship of some of the, um, the gods which who are personification of different uh, forces of nature. For example, the thunderstorm and rain those were uh, associated with uh, the Hindu god uh, Indra and then we also find the gods such as Varuna and Surya, the sun being uh, the Surya and then Varuna being the god of water and waterways. So they have emerged as some of the very important gods during this time period which is also understood as the Vedic time. And the reason for which we do not really have much of the material evidences from the sites uh, from this time is because it is believed that they have uh, prioritized uh, ways in which uh, simple stink living and then making small brick structures and making small mud structures as houses and for um, uh, for for uh, conducting yagna or the sacrificial uh, rites and so on. So those were uh, conducted during this time which did not really have a uh, tremendous amount of material presence in the Indian subcontinent. So that is the reason we do not have much material evidences from those times. So after this time, Time, what we find that I mean the Vedic uh, the customs the Vedic uh, ideology that also stressed on uh, the division of uh, different people and the community 
which started from uh, d dividing people according to their uh, role or responsibilities in the society, which also sort of manifested into this very complicated caste system. And then this caste system was opposed by some of the people, for example, the Ajivikas and then the, um, then the most prominent one perhaps would be Gautama Buddha or Prince Siddhartha. So, some of these rituals that those were established during the Vedic times that we find to be a point for us to uh, understand that why Buddha's intervention was such an important one. So, Buddha he uh, um, uh, encouraged equality and he also encouraged different uh, this uh, the dissolving of this hierarchy and this caste systems which are uh, so much prominent uh, in the Vedic times. So, in those aspects what we find that I mean this this one particular prince who was born in the city of Kapilavastu in uh, in the southern uh, Nepal the, in the in the today's nation state of Nepal that we find there. So, became uh, who was also raised as Prince Siddhartha. So, he uh, became such an important part of uh, the, all these transactions. So, Prince Siddhartha he, uh, he uh, in, in his journey of seeking what is truth, what is truth beneath uh, what all we see in this material world. So, in this journey he started and then he explored various different paths uh, uh, as including a learning from different gurus from the Brahminical and the Hindu customs, then from also learning from the Ajivikas and the ones who did not believe in any religion at all. And from learning and comparing from all these different sources, then finally he came up with this idea of uh, the middle path. And the middle path was also possible during his uh, enlightenment and that happened in the site of Bodh Gaya in uh, today's uh, state of Bihar. So, in Bodh Gaya he had attained enlightenment and this particular moment when he attained enlightenment became such an important part in our uh, not only in the history, but also in the history of art because that encouraged different ways in which we understand architecture, ways in which we understand the idea of the body and so on. So, though that is something we will be studying as part of our exploration of Buddhist architecture and art. Now, just to give us a sense of which area we are talking about mostly. So, in the map in the left side of the screen we have um, of course, in the southern Nepal which is also bordering northern parts of Bihar. From there we find that Kapilavastu is the city from where uh, uh, Prince Siddhartha who would become Buddha had uh, started his journey. From there he had travelled to uh, different sites mostly in Bihar that we find that uh, there are four sites which are the most important ones that we consider to be uh, part of uh, the Buddhist uh, preaching and religion and that will be the first one is of course, Kapilvastu or the garden of Lumbini where he was born and then the other one will be Bodh Gaya where he uh, attended enlightenment. And so, from there he travelled to the city of, uh, he travelled to the, uh, the site of Sarnath which is right outside of this historical city of Varnasi in, in Uttar Pradesh today. So, he uh, travelled there to Sarnath and by the bank of the river Ganges or Ganga, he preached his first sermon. So, that is the reason that is also a place which has been very uh, important in the Buddhist belief as well as in the Buddhist um, art and architecture. And then the next important site for uh, Buddha will be the site where he attended Nirvana or where he left his earthly body and that will be the place Kushinagara that is again situated in the state of Uttar Pradesh today. So, there are all these four important um, uh, moments in Buddha's life is very uh, is celebrated and then those those also became um, a, a reference for the later day uh, architects and artisans and so on for making these structures. And in the right side of the screen we have a representation of 
Gautama Buddha and uh, there are many different um, uh, in many different uh, ways in which we find that I mean uh, Gautama Buddha is represented and one of the uh, most celebrated one we find is to be in this in this cross legged position and this cross legged position or this yogic posture is also something that we can relate it to uh, we what we have studied in the uh, Indus Valley context that how this cross legged position is considered to be this yogic posture and why that is also something uh, that made us think about the, the figures who are represented, the male figures who are represented in the Indus Valley seals to be the yogic figures. So, this is the site we have been talking about that is Bodh Gaya that we see on screen and this particular tree, this particular tree that had been considered to be the tree under which uh, Siddhartha, Prince Siddhartha, he sat down and uh, uh, he, he attended enlightenment and when he attended enlightenment then he became Buddha. And when he, uh, we, when he attended enlightenment, it is believed that he touched the ground or the mother earth with his right arm and then that was the particular moment in which he uh, announced that I mean he had attended enlightenment and he asked the mother earth to be the evidence for it, to bear the evidence that he had attended enlightenment. And that is one of this gestures that we find that it became very uh, important in the Buddhist art and that is this particular way in which he had touched the ground that is called Bhumi Sparsha Mudra and that is touching the earth gesture. And then also what we find that I mean there was uh, this uh, under this tree there was a particular seat which which has been uh, which uh, marks the space where uh, Buddha himself had sat uh, sat down and then attended the uh, attended enlightenment. So that particular area was then later on developed by the later kings and so on. And among them, perhaps that uh, king, uh, the emperor Ashoka. We will come to uh, more details about Emperor Ashoka, but he apparently. Um, installed this one uh, seat that was made of stone that we find in the later uh, in the in the lower half of our of our slide and this uh, seat which was uh, installed by uh, uh, it is believed to be installed by Emperor Ashoka which is still there that we can see in the left side of the image which is now been uh, enthroned and that is sacred site for all Buddhist and people across religion. And in the later times we also find that temples and other uh, architecture those were erected around this area. But the Bodh Gaya temple is not something that we find to be included in the early depiction of Buddhist art and architecture for which we will be talking about some of the early uh, architectural records and some of the ideas which also made a huge impact how we understand art and architecture in the Buddhist context. So, in the Buddhist context something we find to be very important that um, there are different kinds of materials which are used for example, stone, wood and so on and there was uh, also uh, uh, an understanding of under, uh, having body as an architecture or body as a house. So, the house that uh, contains the soul, the house that also contains intellect and everything else. So, this is something that became very much important for Buddha to understand that their larger implication not only in the material world also in the spiritual context for which after he had attended enlightenment he had considered that uh, this body or this house is destroyed and then the enlightened uh, body is something that comes out of the destruction. So, for that reason that there is this idea of destroying um, the superficial structures and making something that is relevant in the Buddhist context that we find. And for those reasons that Buddha never really uh, encouraged making uh, houses or structures which will be made as temples or for recreational or purposes. So, something that we have seen 
for example, that he had uh, spoken about that the living structures. So, for example, if there are living rocks, the rock shelters and places like them, if there are already abandoned houses, if there are uh, shelters which are made by tree and so on, those are the places where people should live. The people who are the followers of Buddha's path should select those places instead of erecting houses or instead of erecting architecture. So, this is something that we find to be very much prominent in the early days of Buddhism. But this idea where one can also imagine that I mean how this idea might also not go well with how we understand architecture. Then how do this idea of um, destroying an architecture, making this uh, you know this newly uh, newly erected body and um, of course this newly constructed body and this 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 things go with architecture. So, in the in some of the historical context we have found that Buddha had uh, spoken about the shelters which are taken during monsoon and this is also another reason why I wanted to uh, uh, speak about the map in the, the, the most important sites in, in Buddha's life because after he attended enlightenment and after he preached his first sermon he had encouraged all his followers, all the Buddhist monks to travel across the country and then also preach the Buddhist teachings. And this is something that had happened that when people travel from one place to another that perhaps this idea of the architecture does not really come uh, very prominently there, but during the monsoon then there needs to be a shelter for all the people and this is not only for protecting the monks and the nuns from uh, the heavy monsoon rain, but also some of the other things that come with the monsoon are the insects, the snakes and so, uh, so on. So, the people also needed to be protected from that. And that is the first evidence we find that how some of the built structures were finally being established during Buddha's lifetime and that is to protect the people from the rains, the, the tropical monsoon. And we know that I mean how this, this part of India in the north and eastern part of India, how the monsoon is really heavy for that reason that protecting people from monsoon should not seem as a surprise. Now, when Buddha had also agreed with making architecture, we find that he had also uh, uh, you know uh, came in agreement with making architecture which will be used by the community and not by some individual which will be used for the you know which will serve purposes for education, for, for worship and all these meditational purposes, but not for recreation and so on. So, those are some of the ideas we find to be very much ingrained in the Buddhist thought and philosophy, which also made a huge deal of impact in terms of how we understand architecture in the Buddhist context. Now, coming back to that what were the references for uh, Buddha to, to start thinking about the uh, role of architecture and some of the early material evidences that we find and this one that, that we have on screen. So, this is a depiction of a pannashala or house which is made of leaves. So, we can see on the screen that there is a medallion and in this medallion or a stone disc which is found from Roper in northern India and this came from 3rd century BC. So, these are some of the early examples. Uh, this can be either Buddhist or it can be of other religious beliefs uh, that includes Hinduism, that includes the Ajivikas or someone else. And here what we find very prominently featured in this stone disc is this, this small very simple hut like structure which is made of leaves. So, if we see the structure that there is a doorway for people to go inside, but it does not really allow too many people to go inside and this is perhaps an ascetic's hut or a hermit's hut. And then what we find here is this entire hut is made from perhaps some kind of structure, a simple structure made from the branches of a tree or bamboo or so on. And then that is also something that we find that is right under a tree which is uh, only shown in fragment on the top of this panashala. 
and the body of the panchashala or this uh, temporary house uh, or this temporary hut that is made of leaves and the leaves are we can see those are arranged in rows and they they have been put together for making this particular structure so this is a kind of structure that we find to be the simplest mode of uh, accommodation which will give shelter to the people like the ascetics the monks and so on and that is something those were also in mind of buddha when he uh, envisioned that people should not be spending too much of effort in making architecture however we see with time that there have been many changes in terms of how architecture the idea of architecture had progressed now some of the things that we find to be very interesting is that uh, how buddha's enlightenment had also made a huge deal of impact on how architecture is perceived so when buddha attended enlightenment it is believed that as as uh, his uh, his head like the top of his head that made a projection and it sort of like i mean grew outward so there was a bump that was created on the top of his head and in many of the images for example the one we have seen in the uh, the first image for for this lecture in this one if we can see that there is a uh, there is a projection on the top of buddha's head that is not really a hair do but this is actually uh, that this wisdom bump that was created after his uh, enlightenment so this projection on the top of his head is something that is a marker of uh, his newly formed body as he had said that the the material body has been destroyed and after uh, he attended enlightenment or bodhi then this newly there is this body that was newly constructed so these are some of the markers of how this body he perceived to be new from the earlier ones and apart from that there were some of the other things which were also uh, been part of his enlightenment we find that there is this sign that i mean how in the forehead right in between the two eyebrows there is this one particular tiny dot that is created there and this is a sign which has been told that there were those flocks of eyebrows and which is also can be considered to be unibrow that was there for buddha it is also something that we find to be uh, part of the uh, his iconography as well as the stand standards of beauty in the indian uh, various indian literature and so on so this particular uh, this particular feature of buddha that was later uh, been represented as a dot or uh, or a bindu so which which is also in some cases that can be confused with the idea of a third eye in the hindu context so these are some of the features we find to be a uh, part of his body which also marked his uh, engagement or like i mean his engagement with the greater truth of the universe as well as his uh, you know his enlightenment so from there if we move to this this idea of how that also made an impact on the architecture that we find to be uh, in in various degrees so the first thing first that we find that how some of the ideas that he carried with that uh, the some of the structures which are already existing in nature how to uh, use them or how the monks can actually inhabit there without putting too much effort in building a place from the scratch so that is something that had encouraged having those rock cut shelters and these are some of the examples that we have on screen so for example the sudama and the lomash rishi cave that we have in the barabar hills in bihar so that those are some of the um, the structures from like 3rd and 2nd century bc so they come as some of the earliest built structures in the entire indian subcontinent that we find today and these are some of the structures as we have already discussed that uh, buddha had encouraged utilizing living rock structures and so on and so that is how perhaps the monks 
from uh, you know uh, when when we see the the Lomosh Rishi cave or from uh, from Sudama cave in Sudama cave we cannot really confirm whether it started during the uh, by the Buddhist or there were other monks and ascetics from different belief systems they had inhabited there or not and so there were parallel developments in this kind of um, activities and these ideas about use utilizing the natural rock shelters and what we find that the simplistic doorways were made perhaps by the kings and the merchants for having spiritual merit that to help the monks and the uh, ascetics and the nuns to have spiritual merit so that their afterlife can be secured. So, those ideas also uh, made uh, those ideas also prompted the kings and the merchants and the wealthy part of the society to contribute to making this kind of structures. And this is also something that we find to be some of the early examples of how stone was uh, utilized for making these structures because if we consider that what we have seen earlier in the Harappan context that there was a use of a brick, there was use of mud structures and so on and if we also consider that I mean what we have seen in this Pannashala that of course I mean that comes in terms of the uh, you know the simple material which are used around people and then those are utilized by ascetics. But then what happens in this case that uh, the use of stone also announces a different um, different development in this context of uh, architecture and what are the different developments that we find that if we see uh, if we have a closer look at the entrance to the Lomashrishi cave that is there in the right side of the image we find this trifoil arch the arch which has this slightly pointed apex and then this particular arch that is also supported by wooden brackets that we find in the uh, which are supporting this arch. So, if we consider that I mean what kind of brackets these are, these are mostly decorative and they, are, they do not really support the arch because it is carved out of stone. So, it also came to uh, signify that this kind of architecture perhaps been already existing in wood and the wood requires brackets to support the arches for supporting the gateways something that is not required in stone. So, these are some of the early examples in which we find that even though these are made in stone, but they actually have some of the references to how architecture was made in wood. And if you ask that what is the significance of this particular trifoil arch, this arch also had a huge importance in terms of Buddha's enlightenment. When his body, uh, when there was this projection on the top of his head, so it is believed that the regular doorways and the regular ceiling cannot really accommodate him. So, there needs to be a, uh, um, there needs to be a way in which like his uh, projection on the top of his head can acc be accommodated and that is how this arch like structures they came into existence or that is how this arch like structures that came as a reminder of Buddha's um, enlightenment and the projection on the top of his head. So, that is how we also find how this particular arch like structure became so much ingrained in the early Buddhist architecture.